Welcome to another private tour. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. The man who is unquestionably the world's foremost expert in the F-5 T-38 family of aircraft is Ron Gibb, a Northrop Grumman retiree. His knowledge is encyclopedic, and he's now going to share some of that with us. Welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. Uh, my name's Ron Gibb. I'm a past Northrop employee of 45 years, and I've worked on the F-5 and T-38 and uh, other aircraft in this museum. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is five ejection seats. And each one is of a different generation, and it's a different time period, and uh, may, should be able to uh, cover that and make it interesting. The original uh, invention of the ejection seat has been attributed to Sir James Martin of Martin Baker in England. And he and his partner, uh, Captain Baker, created the Martin Baker Aircraft Company. And uh, Captain Baker was killed flight testing an aircraft that they built during World War II. And so Sir James became very dedicated to create a system that would uh, allow the pilot to escape safely from an aircraft. And uh, there was a lot of experience from World War II with uh, combat uh, damaged aircraft, and the uh, uh, Germans had used a spring system to eject the pilot, but uh, Sir James was able to take the aircraft capability, develop uh, an aircraft system, uh, and he developed a telescoping catapult uh, that was based on tests that he did with a, a tower. And what he determined was it wasn't necessarily the maximum Gs of 12, 15, or 20 Gs that injured the pilot. It was the onset of Gs uh, and determined that if you stay below 300 Gs per second at the start, then you could minimize the injury to the spline on the pilot. Uh, he took this data, uh, put it into a, a seat uh, that uh, was lightweight, and he did the first ejection out of a jet uh, for the RAF in 1946 at 300 knots and successfully recovered the pilot. Uh, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force and all of the aircraft industry in the United States basically uh, picked that up and they adapted it to start building uh, their own ejection seats. Uh, the Navy liked the idea because uh, the, the problem with launching from a carrier uh, with the catapult not working or the aircraft losing power, the aircraft went into the water in front of the carrier and it ran over it. By having a catapult uh, ejection, uh, they could get the pilot away from the uh, ship and save the pilot. In 1961, Martin Baker developed a zero-zero seat by adding a rocket to the bottom of the seat in addition to the catapult. And that drove the seat up to a high enough altitude to safely recover uh, the pilot, plenty of time to open up the chute. Uh, he introduced this to the world very dramatically uh, at the Paris Air Show in 1961. One of his employees walked out to a seat that was in the middle of the field at the airport there, uh, sat on the seat, strapped in and pulled the handle and fired the seat straight up in the air uh, and had a full recovery. North America developed a seat for the F-86, which is behind me. Uh, it was the first generation seat that is a catapult only. Uh, you could not jettison uh, eject through the canopy, uh, but uh, you had to, the pilot had to wait for the canopy uh, to move aft. He had to duck his head to clear the canopy, and then after the canopy jettisoned, then he would be catapulted out of the aircraft. And this proved to be very helpful in the Korean War and saved uh, pilots that uh, uh, were subject to battle damage. The second generation seat that we have here at the museum is the F-5 seat. Uh, it is common to the T-38, uh, which is the trainer for the Air Force. Uh, the seat was designed by Northrop in 1958 and tested at uh, Edwards Air Force Base on a track that they had up there. And uh, the seat, because uh, it had a requirement from the Air Force to train a pilot with a space suit, pressure suit, the seat is much wider than most seats. Uh, it's a lot bigger seat. Uh, it, is, it has both a catapult and a rocket, and uh, it can eject through uh, the canopy, uh, either in the uh, two-place two F-5B or the single-place F-5A. The seat is qualified to a zero altitude at 120 knots, 
uh, that would uh, save the pilot if he ran off the end of the runway. Uh, it takes about five to six seconds uh, to recover uh, the pilot uh, at uh, that condition at 120 knots. This uh, seat uh, saw extensive combat experience in the F-5s in Vietnam in the mid-60s. And what was, de what was determined from that is the seat needed more stability, it needed to be faster, it needed more thrust, uh, and there were a lot of problems. And as a result, uh, the Air Force decided in 1969 to upgrade both the T-38 and the F-5 ejection seat. And because of my background in aerodynamics, I was involved in the design of a drogue chute that would be installed on the seat. This helps uh, determine uh, the separation uh, from the seat and the uh, pilot. Uh, this drogue chute was an SR-71 drogue chute. It was designed for high speed, and so it could decelerate the seat at high speed ejection. It also stabilizes the seat uh, at the low speed. In addition to the drogue chute, uh, we added a, a larger rocket catapult, and it has a variable angle on it uh, so that the line of thrust from the rocket changed so that when you had a big pilot sitting full down, it was closer to the center of gravity. And when you had a small pilot that sat five inches full up, uh, it uh, was also close to the center of gravity of that pilot. And this helped the stabilization. Uh, the tests on this were done... Uh, at uh, Holloman Air Force Base in uh, 1970 and 1973. The results of this improved seat uh, allowed the ejection envelope to go from 120 knots down to 50 knots on the ground level, and it also dramatically removed or reduced the, uh, uh, the time to take a full blossom at 150 knots. So the five to six seconds that it took in the older seat was now reduced to three seconds. And that made a big difference on sink rate uh, as far as being able to recover uh, the pilots more safely under adverse conditions. I have some high resolution photos from the tests at the Holloman Air Force Base. The first photo is an ejection through the canopy at zero zero with the seat. In order to qualify the seat, you had to demonstrate that the seat could go through the canopy in case it didn't jettison without injury to the pilot or without impact on the performance of the uh, seat. Uh, there is also a 50 knot test. Uh, this test was done without a canopy, basically the same cost because the canopy wasn't being changed. Uh, it takes three tenths of a second for the canopy to clear the, light, the uh, ejection path of the seat. Uh, at that time, the catapult fires. As the seat is going up the rail, uh, the drogue gun fires to pull the drogue chute out horizontally. Uh, and since the seat is going up and the, hors and the chute's going horizontally, uh, you get the line stretch very quickly. At the top of the rail, uh, the catapult has added about 50 feet per second to the velocity of the seat, and that's enough to clear the tail at the high speed of 550 knots in case the rocket doesn't fire. Uh, when the rocket fires, it, it burns for a half a second, and uh, uh, meanwhile the drogue chute is coming out and starting to stabilize the seat. At the end of the rocket burn, uh, it takes place in about one second. Uh, the velocity is about 100 feet per second, and that's enough to drive the seat up to an altitude of 110, 120 feet, which uh, is plenty of time to open the parachute before it comes back to the ground. Uh, when the rocket burns out, the lap belt opens, and there is a rotary actuator that is fired that uh, drives, winds up a strap underneath the pilot and actually kicks him out of the bucket. Uh, and the drogue chute also helps pull it away. Uh, the ripcord for the backpack, the personnel chute, is attached to the lap belt. And so when the pilot separates from the seat, it automatically pulls the ripcord so he doesn't have to remember to do that. And a quarter of a second later, uh, the pilot chute comes out uh, for the parachute and starts deploying the chute. It takes about a second for that to happen. And when the parachute gets the line stretch, there is a spreader gun that has weights uh, attached to each part of the skirt, and it physically blows the mouth of the canopy open to quickly open the parachute. And the parachute will then open, even at this low speed of 50 knots, it'll open in eight tenths of a second. And so that allows the pilot to uh, successfully recover. In addition, uh, we did a 550 knot test 
and the drogue chute really showed its performance under this test. Uh, we ejected two pilots out of a T-38 configuration and uh, the drogue chute decelerated the seat and the pilot from 550 knots down to less than 300 knots in one second. Uh, and then the parachute was deployed and blossomed in one second. And so we recovered the pilot at 250 knots uh, in two and a half seconds uh, and under a very stable controlled condition. In 1974, I led a design team to put a 00 Martin Baker Mark 7 seat in the F-5E and F aircraft for Iran. And during that process, I had the opportunity to go to England and visit the Martin Baker plant in there and uh, had the privilege of meeting and working with Sir James Martin. At that time, he was 81 years old, uh, still running the company on a day-to-day -day basis, and I would say running it very firmly. Uh, there's a little bit of humor uh, that came about uh, during that visit. Uh, he was upset because some of his employees were not keeping the pigeons from dropping on his brand new car. And uh, so the next day he decided to take things into his own hand and uh, brought a shotgun into work and uh, to go after the pigeons. And he, he missed the pigeons, but unfortunately he blew a hole in the radiator of his brand new Rolls Royce. And the next day it was big news in the London Times and uh, he was really upset. He thought some of his employees had <laughs> ratted on him. Uh, but another thing, Sir James are very proud of the fact that of the contributions he'd made to the aerospace industry. Uh, he established an ejection tie club and every pilot that had been saved uh, ejecting with a Martin Baker seat uh, was invited into that club. And currently at this day, there are over 7,500 pilots that have, their lives have been saved uh, with Martin Baker seats. And uh, over half of those, 3,500 of them, were from U.S. aircraft. So, The third generation seat that we have is a Martin Baker Mark 12 seat that was installed in the British Harrier uh, that's here at the museum. Uh, because of the zero takeoff capability of the Harrier, uh, it if it had a problem, it could become unstable. And so the Mark 12 seat was a much faster seat than uh, the earlier seats in order to accommodate that. Uh, the, the fourth generation seat uh, is a Mark 16 seat, which is a very modern seat that's in the NASA T-38. Uh, NASA had a requirement when they were doing the space shuttle that every crew member had to be exposed to flying a supersonic aircraft. And so they were trained to fly in the T-38. And because you had some 100-pound female teachers and you had some 240-pound uh, instructors and, and scientists, uh, the seat had to be expanded. To, so instead of the standard 140 to 200 weight, 200-pound weight, uh, the seat had to be capable of uh, recovering a 100-pound female or a 240-pound 6-foot-6 uh, six six, uh, scientist. The fifth seat, the fifth generation seat, is probably one of the best ejection seats that have ever been developed. It is the Stencil S3S seat uh, that was made by Stencil Aero Engineering in North Carolina. It was developed by the Navy uh, when they uh, started operating the Harriers they got from the British. Uh, being that the Harrier is a zero takeoff aircraft and become very unstable quickly if there was a problem, uh, the Navy wanted to be able to eject at very high bank angles. In fact, if the aircraft had some height, they wanted to be able to eject horizontally and still recover the pilot. And so Stencil was able to speed up the system uh, with this seat. It's a very lightweight seat. It's very small. Uh, it's very complex, it has a lot of parts, but uh, it has been very reliable because they have high redundancy and duplication on every key function. Uh, the time to recover the pilot uh, with the Harrier going through the canopy, uh, they had a full recovery under 00, zero and 1.7 seconds. And because the standard Air Force ACE seat and most of the Martin Baker seats have the rocket pack on the bottom of the seat, 
Uh, and even though the F-20 was based on the T-38 and F-5 and meets the standard Air Force cockpit, uh, neither seat will fit in the cockpit because the rocket pack being below the floor line uh, on the F-20 and T-38, uh, the sheet metal floor below that are all the flight control cables. So there weren't too many options for Northrop to be able to install a zero zero seat uh, in the F-20. And this became a perfect fit because of its size and weight. Stenso Aero Engineering was able to make the seat very lightweight by incorporating uh, the catapults, the tubes, as the basic backbone of the seat. So you didn't have to duplicate structure in the aircraft and the seat. Uh, in addition, there's a high degree of redundancy on this seat to make it very reliable. Uh, the first thing is there are two initiators that start the sequence to fire the catapults. There are two catapults, and either one can operate. And there are two rockets that are fired, and either one can operate. And there's two stabilization lines. And when you do fire the rockets, there's four initiators that fire, and only one initiator could fire both, uh, ignite both rockets. So that uh, added, even though it's a complex system, it added an extreme amount of reliability. The other thing they did is they created four modes. They have one mode for one time sequence at zero, zero and low altitude, low speed. They have a mode two for low altitude, high speed. Uh, they have a mode three for medium altitude between seven and 14,000 feet. And then they have a fourth mode uh, above 14,000. And if there is a high altitude, high speed ejection, uh, the pilot stays in the seat until it descends to 14,000 feet in order to protect the pilot and provide him with the oxygen that's on board. The basic design is completely automatic. All the pilot has to do is pull the handle and he can be unconscious and the system will go through his complete recovery. There were three innovative designs that were new in ejection seats. And you need to understand this all took place 40 years ago in the middle of the 70s. But uh, the first innovative design was what they call a DART system, D-A-R-T, and it's a directional automatic reorientation of the trajectory. And what it is, is there's two long lines that are in a reel on the bottom of the seat, and those lines are physically attached to the aircraft. And as the rocket burns, uh, the lines are deployed through a snubber that keeps the seat oriented uh, in the proper direction. And the stability is a big problem because the seats are basically L-shaped. The minute they get in the airstream, the first thing they want to do is flip around and fly backwards because that's the best aerodynamic configuration. So the problem is keeping that seat aligned properly uh, to get the maximum altitude away from the ground or the aircraft. Uh, at the end of the rocket burn, the end of the line at the bottom of the seat pulls out so the seat is completely free uh, from the aircraft. But it does, it does take a little off the altitude you can reach because you've got a force that the, the uh, rockets are fighting. Uh, the second innovation design is, is when you get to rocket burnout, uh, there's a word, wind-oriented rocket deployment. There's actual a rocket on the back here that deploys uh, from uh, the seat and fires uh, uh, the line that pulls the main chute out quickly, very quickly. And then the third innovation is at the end of that line, uh, there is a spreader gun that has weights to the skirt of the canopy of the parachute. And it physically blows the uh, uh, parachute open very quickly. So in the F-20, even with the 0.3 second delay to jettison the canopy, the 1.7 second uh, time on the Harrier goes to two seconds. Uh, but it is still very fast. And then this picture, uh, the pilot just wears a harness. Uh, the parachute is in this container here. It's pressure packed, vacuum packed. Uh, the, the pilot chute is in this container. And uh, so everything's uh, clear to deploy after from, from the uh, ejection seat. And finally, just uh, during one test uh, at 150 knots at Holloman with the seat with, uh, for the, in the F-20, uh, the response time to get to full blossom was 1.6 seconds from the start of the initiation. And what that would permit, if the aircraft was upside down and the, air, and the seat was firing down, 
the pilot would be recovered at 150 feet of altitude. And uh, that was outstanding performance for that time. These five seats are just a few of the items that we have uh, at the museum here of interest to people, and we hope that you can come down and visit us, and we hope we can answer any of your questions you may have uh, relative to this, these items. So.